Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? I'm Lori lamenti -Gardi. I'm with Silicon Valley Bank, and it's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, for those of you that are not here to learn about angel investing, now would be the time to leave. This, is, this panel is on angel investing. Um, those of you that are excited to, to uh, learn about angel investing, what it takes as a future entrepreneurs to get funded by angel investors, welcome. Um, so a little bit about me. I, at SVB, I manage the bank's relationships with angels, universities, and incubators. So I've immersed myself in the angel world for the past um, 12 to 18 months, and it's really, really exciting to be here to talk with our panel here. We have a really unique and diverse mix here. We've got two very, very successful entrepreneurs that have raised significant, amount, significant amounts of capital, uh, both from angels um, as well as from institutional investors. We have a mix as far as one is a serial entrepreneur and the other is a first time entrepreneur. So you're gonna hear a unique perspective in terms of their experiences in raising capital and what it's been like. Um, we also have the great pleasure of having two really wonderful angel investors who have been at this for quite a long time. So um, we have Bob Zip and, um, and Aiden Sunkett. Um, who both have a fund um, that they invest through and who have seen a lot of deals over the years. So I'm actually going to let our panelists, rather than read their bios, I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves and maybe talk for, um, for Bob and Aiden, talk a little bit about how you got into angel investing. And for Anu and Todd, maybe talk a little bit about your companies and your, your fundraising process. So we can start with you, Bob. Okay. Uh, my name is Bob Zip. I'm a uh, founder and managing general partner of a fund called Amicus Capital uh, in San Francisco. Uh, I founded Amicus uh, in 1998. Uh, initially, it was a $25 million fund. It's structured as an ever evergreen, so I've continued to invest out of proceeds, and I've invested close to $40 million to date. Um, I focus on uh, very early stage companies, typically uh, two people, two entrepreneurs and a business plan is sort of what I say. Um, Pre-product, pre-revenue, you know, immediately post-conception usually. Um, I got into uh, investing uh, as a lawyer. I, for the 10 years before I started Amicus, I was a lawyer with uh, Brobeck, Flager & Harrison and with Venture Law Group here in the Silicon Valley representing tech companies. Uh, and in that process came to know uh, many uh, angel investors and institutional VCs, uh, was interested uh, in being on the other side of the table and took, took the, the opportunity when it arose. Great, thank you. Anu? Uh, sure. Um, my name is Anu Shukla. I'm a, a serial entrepreneur. I founded three companies and I've used uh, both angel funding and VC funding. Actually, all three companies were VC backed and also had some uh, angel money to get us off the ground. I have on occasion angel invested myself. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think I was, we were discussing this panel before and I thought it was particularly interesting that um, the times have kind of changed in terms of how you can get to revenue a lot faster and it changes the flavor of how anybody should view funding, angel, VC, or otherwise. My name is Aiden Senkut. Um, I've been making angel investments for the last four years through my um, entity, Felices Ventures. I was an early Googler. I was there from 99 to 05. I started as the first product manager and was responsible for the international expansion. And uh, when I left, um, I kind of took advantage of this wave of um, costs going dramatically down to uh, start a company, uh, mostly in the consumer internet and mobile sector. Um, and uh, in the four years, I made uh, over 50 investments and have 11 exits to date. And uh, um, even though I invest in a smaller financial scale compared to Bob, uh, what I try to do is really help the entrepreneurs with getting the best investors, uh, helping them form syndicates, and then uh, really helping them at major uh, turning points in their companies. And I also happen to be to happen to know Todd as a friend and also an investor in his company. So it's it's a very interesting perspective today to be on the panel. Uh, my name is Todd Satridati. I actually uh, attended Stanford Business School, graduated in 2003. Uh, and in August of 2006, I raised money for a company called Bright Roll, which I co-founded with uh, an engineer who I knew from my prior company. 
Uh, since that point, we've raised uh, three rounds, a million dollar angel round, and then two subsequent institutional rounds. Um, so I've sort of learned uh, a lot about the fundraising process, both as a first time entrepreneur and as uh, going through both angel and institutional uh, fundraising processes. Um, so look forward to the, the dialogue. Great. What I hope to do in the next um, hour, and a, hour and 15 minutes or so is really help demystify the fundraising process, um, give you some insights on what angels look for when they're looking for deals, and also um, just some strategies around how you might approach fundraising from angels and some of the differences and nuances between raising angel funding and institutional funding. So I'm going to save plenty of time for Q&A, but we're going to start a kind of a general dialogue right now. And um, you know, if you have questions, feel free to, to chime in as we go along. So, um, so Todd, to kick it over to you first. Sure. So I read, um, I once, I read somewhere that when you read, when you raised your first round of funding that you had nine angel investors yep. lined up for that. So can you maybe talk a little bit about how you got to nine and what it was like corralling nine angels? I mean, we often hear that an hurting angels is like hurting cats and so. Yeah. I'd imagine that was kind of an overwhelming process. Yeah, it was challenging. Um, I think that you know, at that time, we were, as a company, myself and my co-founder, we really made the decision that we wanted to have angel investors and not institutional investors. Um, a lot of that was driven by, you know, we were extremely early stage. We still wanted to have a lot of flexibility around making decisions. We didn't want to sort of have a huge overhang of, of capital in the company. And uh, we were still just iterating really quickly and and from our diligence with other companies we had heard that that sort of that was the right pr right path and so we pursued it um, so we met in the process probably about 50 investors through that process um, most of the leads that we talked to during the process came from you know a very small set of personal relationships and then asking you know every investor we talked to to give us two or three other names of people that you know they thought highly of and it really is very much an iterative process uh, through that group um, but we talked about this on the call earlier, but the most important thing for us during that process was to find somebody who's willing to lead the round. And, and the person who's willing to lead the round um, really ended up corralling the group and sort of driving the group, driving the process, driving the timing. And so once we found that, it did make the process a lot easier. Um, but still, it was definitely hurting cats for the, for the beginning process and really just trying to get interest. Mm -hmm. And Anu, how about you? Um, <coughs> Maybe talk a little bit. So for three companies, you've been out there, and I understand that you've intentionally raised from angels. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Um, yes. To me, it was, I always, um, when I started these companies, I always thought they were targets for venture money. The first company I did was a company called Rubric, um, for which I raised about $13.6 million from venture capitalists. And um, initially, the, our angels were my co-founders, you know, relatives and my relatives and myself. So what we wanted to do was really take a uh, you know, quarter of a million or half a million dollars and prove our concept so we could get a higher valuation in Series A. And that, I thought, was the, the, the sum total of the reason to raise angel money, is that we need some seed money, whether it's coming from me or a group of people, interested people. We didn't really think about the value they could add. It was just these people are going to put money in without any questions, without even a meeting. They're just going to send a check. Okay? And they're never going to talk to us again. <laughs> <laughs> they're never going to talk to us again. And what we're going to do with this money is we're going to you know, go talk to prospective customers, maybe build a prototype, and then spend the time to pay for the office, and then go talk to venture capitalists. So my goal was always to get to a VC, because in the first company I was building an enterprise software company. It was rumored that you needed you know, $50 million to really build an enterprise software company. Uh, you know, we managed to have an exit after raising $13.6 million for about $366 million. So everybody was happy, including our angels, who made a ton of money. And we always did this as a convertible because it was a small amount, so they got in at the Series A valuation with a little warrants and stuff. For the second company, same. I was building an enterprise software company, which evolved into a SaaS company. Again, it takes a lot of money to build those. And so I was in a position to put more money as an angel myself, but also, uh, again, friends and family, co-founders, relatives, that sort of thing. Generally, the first group that had invested in the first company came along. 
Um, and then I did the third company, which is called Off of Pal Media. And over here, I also took a little bit of Angel, but I found that this is, you know, Web 2.0. I could actually get the product built pretty quickly without too much Angel money even. And again, my target was just to get to that, you know, VC round at the highest valuation possible. So I raised, you know, $4.6 million in my Series A after putting in, you know, a quarter of a million of Angel from various same friends and family. And uh, never thinking that the angel would add any value, except send the check and don't bother me. And it turns out that OfferPal, you know, became profitable in three months and started to hit triple digit revenue. We never touched that funding. And so when I look back at it, I said, you know, we shouldn't have raised any money at all. Mm-hmm. Or we should have really gone to some angels who could add value and maybe raised a million to make us feel good and attract talent. And this wasn't a VC deal at all. Mm-hmm. You know, not if you can hit profitability in three months. Mm-hmm. Maybe you go for venture then, and then you get a much higher valuation. So I'm really rethinking my whole, just take uh, some non-obtrusive angels and then go straight for VC strategy. I'm completely rethinking it for venture number four. Mm-hmm. Good. <laughs> good. It's good to be thinking of venture number four as well. Um, so, and Bob and, and I, and I know that you're both pretty hands-on, so maybe we can talk a little bit about the difference between a value-added investor and a non-value-added investor. So, um, in your opinion, how, how involved are you? You're pretty involved with your companies. What are some of the things that you're doing for your companies as you invest in them? So, let me take a first shot at it because my answer is going to be uh, non-traditional. Um, let me requalify. I am not hands-on. I am high value add, or at least that's my goal. And let me also clarify what that means. So a lot of people ask me as an angel, well, how much time do you spend with your companies? And as you well know, this is not about quantity, it's about quality. I feel that there are four or five major milestones in the company's history. And to the extent that I can help in those and not really uh, mix in or cause any trouble with the founder and always be there when the founder needs me, that's the highest value I can add. The first milestone is fundraising. So the most important thing I can do for the founder is, like Todd said, um, getting that lead and getting the right investor mix is really important. And a lot of time, because the founders are also running the company and growing the company, they don't have time to really understand the investor universe and figure out what is the best match for them. So that's one area I can help. Uh, The second one um, is hiring and critical decisions in the company. And when I started, uh, I've seen how some of the things could be greatly done at Google, and I think that was a very valuable experience. I also went to business school, but I feel a lot of the significant things I learned at Google, how they did things out of the box. Um, In terms of other value add or high important milestones in a company's history, um, then there are like important hiring decisions or um, um, sales decisions, so that's where I try to come in, make connections. And the very last one is when actually a liquidity event happens. Um, I don't think we see as many IPOs today, but the acquisitions are pretty common. And that's a very, very tough process. And being able to get exposure for my companies, increasing their potential likelihood, I can spend one hour on a phone call, uh, actually make an exit happen, or double the company's value. It's val- worth more than a 1,000 hours I can spend with the founder. And also, I think there is value in not calling the founder every week, what have you done for me lately? You know, I mean, kind of leave the guy or you know, woman to, to, in peace, like they can run their company, but like be there for the important things. So um, I, I think this is one of the important things. There's always this talk of like Valiad VC, Valiad um, Angel. Uh, I am very pragmatic about that. I mean, it's all about the real value you can create for the founder. It could be one call, it could be a connection, uh, but being able to follow through that and execute that is very important. So would you ever invest in a company that you felt you couldn't add value or that really was looking for a passive investor? That I, I would not because the other thing I was going to say, I mean, I don't want to get too far carried away from the conversation, but you know, you have to understand that venture capital is not about risk business, it's about risk reduction business. So we're looking for great opportunities, huge traction, huge growth, and how we can reduce that risk so we can make that outcome as likely as possible. So if I can add any value, then I'm dumb money, and there's a lot of capital out there, so there is no sense for me to get involved because basically the very first thing I'm trying to do is can I help this company in any way to reduce the risk and increase the value of the investment and create a win-win situation. How about you, Bob? I, I agree totally. I'm, in my experience, uh, and, and I've invested in 50 companies too, although over a, a much longer time horizon, uh, there's an inverse relationship between the level of investor involvement and uh, likelihood of success. 
the best companies uh, have very strong entrepreneurs with uh, uh, their own minds. Uh, we're very clear about where the company is going, uh, and happy investors who show up at board meetings and uh, you know enjoy the results. High fives all around. Um, you know, the, one of the first companies that I invested in uh, was subsequently invested in by uh, a venture investor who is no longer in the business, and you'll you'll understand why when I tell you this anecdote. Uh, mm -hmm. For the first 18 months of uh, this person's management uh, of, of the investment, he had the CEO of the company call him every day. Every day at 4 p.m., uh, the CEO would call, explain what he had done that day, and explain what he planned to do the next day. And amazingly, uh, to the CEO's credit, to the founder CEO's credit, you know, the company was a su success, but he hated every minute of it. And that guy, uh, at, you know, although he perceived himself to be highly involved and highly value-add, he was actually a value, you know, limiter, value detractor. So, you know, I, I agree completely with, with Aiden. Uh, you want to find uh, investors who, are, who have experience, who are there to provide a, uh, helpful advice and counsel uh, when you need it, and uh, who are not stepping on your toes when you don't need it. So shifting gears a little bit, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the process and what it takes to actually, for as investors, what it takes for you to invest, and as entrepreneurs, what it takes to get to a term sheet. So um, in the past 12 months, Aiden and Bob, how many deals have you invested in, and how many deals have you seen relative to that? So what, you know, get us, give, a, give the folks here a sense of, of what your deal flow is actually like. So I invested over a dozen deals in 2009, and that was a very tough year. And uh, I, I'm probably right now, I mean, it's hard to remember exactly how many deals that I've seen, but incoming leads is probably around 10 to 12 a day. And I, I mean, I have to be honest with you, it's impossible to keep track of all of this, so it's really exciting. And I have to pick and choose which are the best potential options so I can really help them. Um, in terms of investment process, again, I think, uh, you know, the most important thing here is uh, every six to 12 months, like Todd's, uh, uh, l let's just take a deal. So when I spoke to Todd, he had some critical elements of what I'm looking for. So number one, right at that time, video was exploding and I'm like, okay, so I missed that wave. It's too late to invest in video because it's already exploding. What's the next big thing? Video monetization. So that was one of the five areas I was looking into and that's exactly what Todd was targeting. The second thing is he was referred to me by somebody that I really trust who's an entrepreneur himself and is a very good friend. So I could, you know, I already knew Todd, but then I had somebody that could really watch for him, so that's another really important thing. And then finally, the thing that really what it boils down to is, you know, you're looking basically, uh, uh, when you're meeting the entrepreneurs and investor, you want to have confidence that whatever they're saying, they're going to deliver. Uh, they're in an exciting business that's going to grow fast. Um, they have kind of figured out what they need to do. They have a good plan, and they're going to create what I call an unfair advantage and uh, they have the best chance to do so. So when I looked at Todd's track record, I'm like, great, like he's already worked at a great company, you know, and, and everything that he told me, he had a strong grasp of the business, and more importantly, he knew what his differentiation was gonna be. It wasn't just a PowerPoint of, oh, everybody's like, oh, this is a billion dollar market, you know, we're gonna go, and here's the competitive matrix, all of that. I, what I really want to hear is how you're gonna excel and make a difference uh, with your idea, and how likely are you to do that? And just to kind of extend on the previous point, um, in the beginning, it's not like you have all the chips you want, you right? It's you and your co-founder, maybe one or two other people. You have to look at your investors and advisors as your extended team. Whatever is the strengths you don't have, whatever is the domain expertise you don't have, that's basically an, an important function of your investors and advisors. Being able to get that mix right is one of the most important things. You have the best team, even if you don't have the best idea, you have much higher chances to win. My funnel's a little bit smaller than uh, than Iden's. I probably looked at uh, looked actively at, at 200 deals last year. Um, invested in five, uh, and by looked actively, I mean at least had a had a meeting face to face uh, and and thought about it. Um, uh, now I agree with Iden that that it's uh, uh, you know it's 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 a challenge to to be able to. To provide good feedback uh, to every entrepreneur who wants to meet with you, and, th and that's that's probably my biggest issue and, and my my biggest regret. Uh, uh, you know, I wish I could provide more to to all the entrepreneurs out there who are looking for funding and looking for feedback. 
So how does somebody grab your attention, though? Is it making that personal connection to to you? Is there, you know, if I'm an entrepreneur and I want to, I want to get your attention. It's coming in through a trusted source. Is, it uh, it, uh, is the way to to optimize success. Come in through uh, a lawyer, an entre- you know, who, who who is well connected in the community, an entrepreneur who's well known in the community, or someone in my network, another investor. Those are typically the three best ways. I agree with Bob, and I'm going to try to expand, and hopefully I can put this into a framework for you. So all you're trying to do when you're trying to meet investors is create a positive bias. So let me explain what I say. Uh, Most of the entrepreneurs I'm I'm meeting, all you have to do is 10% more homework. Do your homework in terms of who you're meeting, what they invested in the past, um, have they said anything in the press in terms of areas that they're looking at, and anything in their background indicates that they're going to be interested in your idea. So people just kind of like launch into their presentation, they're excited about their company, but they don't even think, first of all, they didn't even read the body language, does this person even care about the idea or even meeting me? Is there a good chemistry? I mean, you have all the sources now, Google, LinkedIn, Facebook. I mean, you can get so much information in very short time about the person. Find out if they have a positive bias. If they're a biker, you're a biker, that's a positive bias. If they worked in healthcare, you're trying to do a healthcare startup, that's a positive bias. Uh, if they invested in you know, five video related companies and they are knowledgeable about advertising and you're trying to do advertising, that's a positive bias. What I'm trying to say is if you try to talk to an investor that looks great on paper but has no connection to your idea, you're not gonna get the connection and you're gonna be frustrated because you're gonna keep having meetings and you're like, why is this person re- not, not relate to my idea? It's because they don't care, right? Like, how do you make them care about the idea? How do you make them care about talking to you? And that's one of the most important things you need to get across. So when somebody says, um, get some more traction, what, if an entrepreneur hears that, is that something that they should hear, should they interpret that as really get some more traction, or is that a polite brush off? Because I think that's an important, uh, entrepreneurs hear that quite frequently. Well, they also hear it's intriguing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> or find a lead uh, and I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah, I think get, get some more traction is probably 99% of the time that's a polite way of saying no, honestly. Uh, or uh, a polite way of just kicking the can down the road and, and trying to stay uh, connected with the entrepreneur in case something good happens in the future. And intriguing means no, uh, unless a Kleiner drops you a term sheet, in which case <laughs> I want to call me back. <laughs> I mean, I'd add a little to that. I think that as a first-time entrepreneur, you know, a little bit of traction was extremely important in my process. So, you know, if I were raising angel money today, I think off of, you know, reputation relationships, I'd have a lot more success than I would have at, than I did at the time that I started. And so when I started the company, I started it while I was working at another startup. You know, it was nights and weekends, and we worked on it for six months till we had a, you know, a proto- working prototype. We had a couple customers. Um, and then, you know, I left that company, and I spent three months building the product before I went to raise angel money because I felt that, you know, at that time, with my reputation, I wasn't going to be able to raise angel money without traction. And so maybe the feedback would have been, get some traction, maybe that was good feedback. So I think that, that you know, I think the, the, sort of the earlier you are in your career, and if it's your first time entrepreneur, traction of any kind is, is a great indicator and, and something that you should focus on, mm-hmm. um, not just an idea and a, and a deck. So. Mm-hmm. But there's traction, and then there's, I just filed the S1 for the IPO. <laughs> no. okay. It's somewhere, you know, you have to qualify what traction really is. Mm-hmm. Right? And how many angels did you approach before you got funding in your first company? I actually didn't approach any of them. They approached me. They did. Because remember, they were part of a close-knit group. Okay. Uh, you know, so it's basically people that were involved with the company, even like an en- a founding engineer, would say, well, you know, my dad wants to put in 100 k kind mm-hmm. of thing. So we're like, okay, maybe we'll take it. So how long, how long is the process? How long does it take for you guys to come to a decision? Is it, you know, you know in the first, you had me at hello? <laughs> Did you know I mean, the it first can take 20? anywhere from 48 hours to multiple weeks. Partly it's, it's, so again, I mean, I think everything kind of boils down to the different risk involved with making the startup successful. So there is funding risk. So let's say that you already have a lead and you have some of the rounds spoken for, that, that decreases. Then you have team risk. So how comprehensive is it? Is the team? Is it just one founder? Is it two founders with two really good people with some great advisors attached, right? So it kind of comes down to the traction problem. If somebody's asking for traction, basically the translation of all these different things, intriguing traction, whatever, are two things. Number one, there are not enough data points for me to be to have conviction. And number two, 
Uh, it could also be, you know what, I'm not really a capable person to, ha to be convicted at early stage, so I'm going to make the investment as late as possible to reduce all the risk. And that's, I, I think, the black art of being a good investor. How early can you make that decision and can still be right or have good chances of being right? Um, but, you know, basically what I'm trying to tell you, there are some times when, you know, the deal is so hot that supply and demand, it's an incredible founder, great idea, no, no brainer, and you just, as an investor, you want to be involved with that kind of an entrepreneur and deal, you, you know, assuming that there's a good match. And sometimes it's, it's a tough process. I mean, there have been times when I'm the first investor that spoke to a founder, and we literally called every single investor, got in the round together, and it took longer. But, you know, the outcome was still the same. It's a positive outcome, getting it. And uh, again, it's very important when you're actually going through the process yourself. I mean, Todd said he spoke to 50 investors and got to nine. So it all comes down to like checking off every risk factor and really asking yourself, have you really covered all the important risk? And in the investor's mind, have you convinced them that you have the best chance of winning against the odds? And do you have the right unfair advantages to beat those odds? Very good. So what about valuation? I mean, how do you value, you know, Bob, I think about you, it's a concept, it's a PowerPoint, you know, you've got a team here that's ready to go. Is it you throw a dart or? You know? Generally, the, the deals are valued in two ways. They're either valued as a function of uh, the venture round, a, a subsequent venture round, and so uh, structured as a convertible note with some, you know, warrants or a discount or something so that the, the whole valuation question is sort of moved down, uh, down to the, the, uh, the next fundamental event. Or if uh, the deal is priced, you know, generally it's priced within uh, a, a valuation range that assumes that there'll be a, a reasonable markup uh, on a subsequent venture investment. And that may, that sort of moves, target moves up and down, uh, at, you know, depending on the market and the time and the environment and so forth. Um, but, but it's generally within, within a range. So I think the simplest way to look at it, this is the question that gets most asked, how do you value a company? So it's very simple, it's supply and demand. In every other place in the world, for any price, it's how much supply you have and how much demand you have. If you have a lot of supply, you have no demand, the price is gonna be low. So the most important thing for you is not to take that personally. Your job is to increase the demand, right? Um, so when you're looking at the valuations, I mean, it's ridiculous, but for all the sophistication we have at business school and science we learn, really, you don't really have any data points to go by. So Everything else being equal, somebody who has more conviction and positive bias towards your idea is probably going to be more um, uh, receptive to paying a higher price to be involved in your company. But again, the most important function is demand. And then basically for the investors to have enough of a stake to compensate for the early risk they're taking. I mean, it's a fine balance, right? As an, in, as an entrepreneur, you don't want to give up too much of your company, but you also have to be smart in the sense that if you get the right people and the company gets really big, you might be giving a little more of your company, but then the overall pie is bigger. Having an 80% of a company that is not valued at anything is not a good thing either. Either. So have a reasonable balance, and I think it's really important to incentivize and motivate your investors for the right investors, right? So don't always get stuck at this, oh, I need to have the perfect terms. No, I think it is a balance of terms, who the investors are, and how much value you feel they're going to bring on the table, and are they going to be able to plug in any of the holes that you have in your team or in your company. From the entrepreneur's perspective, do you guys have a different view? Or? Yeah, I would just add that. You know, during my process, uh, you know, I was really focused on basically two things. One was completing it successfully, i.e. raising the money. And the second thing was having the process be as short as possible because, you know, we were a small team with limited resources and we really just didn't want to be distracted. And so when I talked to lots of different sort of entrepreneurs that had been through the process, it, it seemed to me that as a first time entrepreneur, the fastest route was to pick a valuation that was within the bounds of being fair and doing a closed round, not doing a conversion. Uh, because it was just easier for people to understand they can make the decision faster and they didn't have to worry about you know the terms around the convertible and so I basically just picked a valuation that was comparable to other deals that had gotten done and said it's a series A and, and, and that proved to be successful of course there's some you know maybe we gave up some margin we could have made more by having it converted the later round but the reality was I got the money and it was fast and that was the most important to us mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm in the same boat there because I just uh, talked to comparable companies and looked at what their Series A was done at and for the angel, how much discount was I, w I was willing to do and work backwards from there. 
But I have to point out that one of the things that we didn't consider in the angel round, we considered the fact that we could get this money and get going, and there was no overhead associated with raising the money, mm -hmm. which was you know probably very convenient. But I think we missed an opportunity at all three companies uh, that I did, although all of them are successful. Um, that was you know getting the right angel involved could have you know helped us in many many other ways mm -hmm. um, and we always thought once we get VC funding we'll go get an advisory board and we'll put them in place and we'll pay them give them stock uh, to help us but I think that uh, we never gave enough um, importance to getting the right angel involved early in the company and that's mm -hmm. something if I had to do it over I would I would rethink that company number four Company number four is on its way already. Shaping yeah. up to a nice company yeah. so far. Um, so, you know, one, one thing I'd love to talk about since we're on the subject is how does an entrepreneur come up with the right amount to raise in the first round? Is it, is it, it, does it really come down to supply and demand, what angels are willing to invest in it? Or, you know, is there kind of a, a set rule? And that's, a, that's a really good question because I have to say that everything that I'm saying on this panel um, are limited to consumer internet and mobile companies. So it's an important distinction, right? And the reason for that is A, that's where I have the experience, and B, that's where I've seen is um, the, the higher, highest chances of growing a company fast. That doesn't mean that you can't have a very successful company in CPG or in semiconductor or in any other areas. There are a lot more friction points. Getting things right and getting through those hurdles is tougher and it's gonna require more capital. So that's where I focus where I focus. But I think the lessons are still applicable to other areas as well. And then when I thought, talked about supply and demand, I, I actually talked about the price. Uh, in terms of how much capital to raise, it's again, I think it's a surfing analogy, right? So you're right at the edge of that wave. You don't want to raise too much capital where you get too lax. You also don't want to raise too little capital that you run out of money or you have to go raise money a little bit too soon. The whole point here is that not getting too carried away from the real value of the company. Of course, as an entrepreneur and CEO, you think very highly of yourself and the company, and you should, and you should have a healthy dose of ego, but you should also be realistic in terms of, you know, not, not, not that valuation to get carried away too much because you're going to have to build the company to that level. So everything else being equal, raising just enough money to get you to that next step. And as Anu said, and I think Todd implied, you know, uh, the important traction points where it's obvious the company is growing fast, it's obvious you're checking all the check marks and you have a leadership position that's going to get you a higher valuation. And don't raise capital unless you need to, right? I mean, um, I heard an example that Microsoft raised a total of a million. Uh, eBay raised five million, Google raised 25 million, and you know that was probably for good reason. But a lot of these companies probably raised a lot less than you expected for the size of the companies they are now. So just remember that, and I know this is easier said than done, especially if you're in semiconductor, CPG, or life sciences. But again, the goal is like if you're in life sciences, you know, try to find somebody who knows the area, who can help you with the FDA process, or you have a brilliant idea and somebody that can help you avoid costly mistakes. Uh, and avoid uh, getting into some of those friction points. Um, when we sat down to, to, to think of how much money we would need, I think it was all about uh, having the money to reach a milestone, the next milestone. So whether it was uh, shipping the product or first revenue. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, we talked a little bit about traction, that you know when you go to VCs or angels and say, well, you really need a little bit more traction before I can really believe in it, and what that really means. I still have to say that the first round of the Series A that you raise is the easiest round, okay? The bar really goes up significantly from there because you have to explain what you did with that four million and where you're at right now. And now there are other people there that need a certain type of exit and you're trying to raise the value. So in, in some ways it's the easiest round, uh, but it's also important to take, as, as Aiden said, the right amount of money to get you to that next important milestone because the bar is higher when you get there. So it's called raising on hope versus raising on reality, right? Yes. When you're raising your Series C, you're now being compared because you have real revenue, so you're gonna be you know, judged on almost public market multiples or some stricter financial criteria versus early on, you know, you're kind of mostly raising money on hope in terms of who you are, what a great idea you have, and how convicted people are that you're gonna be able to execute to grow this company. The practical response that I give to entrepreneurs to that question is, you know, think think about the, the PowerPoint deck that you're going to uh, present to the to the institutional first institutional VC that you meet, and what would you like to have in there? What would you like to have in there in terms of, you know, progress that you've made with with the uh, the angel capital that you've raised? 
um, plan to, to, you know, how long will it take you to achieve those milestones? You know, add three to six months, add three months worth, worth of run rate. Uh, and, and that should be the target raise amount. Usually that works out to, to somewhere between 12 and 18 months in my experience. And Todd, I think you, you mentioned something earlier about um, finding entrepreneurs that have raised angel funds and the importance of that in terms of shadowing them. How, how Maybe you could talk a little bit about that and how that helped you with your, your round. Yeah. Um, so one of the, you know, I, when I look back at my angel fundraising process, the, the sort of key person and the key sort of element in that process was a friend of mine who had literally just went through the angel investing, sort of angel fundraising process himself. Um, and, you know, as GSP students are connected to Stanford, there's lots of people that are alumni that have went through this same process, probably in a similar industry in the last, you know, sort of 12 to 24 months. And so there, to have a shorthand for so many of the decisions made my life so much easier. So I said, you know, how much do I need, need to raise? I did all my calculations trying to figure it out, and I had a benchmark. Well, he raised a million, so, and uh, all things be equal, look like I was about the same number, so that seems about right. So what was his valuation? He picked a value, I was very close to his valuation. And, you know, who I went to talk to were similar to he went to talk to. So in a lot of ways, having a shorthand for something that had zero experience in made the process you know, enormously more efficient for me. And uh, that's been true at every stage. So you know, I've now raised two rounds. And I always try to find people who, you know, because the market is different. Raising a Series C today is very different than a year ago or two years ago. So you try to find people who've just done it, and you try to learn as many uh, shorthand lessons as possible. So uh, maybe shifting gears a again, um, I want to talk about how angels themselves and how maybe all angels are not created equal. So we, we talked about value-added angels and non-value-added angels. Um, <clears throat> is there a difference between professional angels, so people that do this as a living versus casual angels? And, and maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the VCs that actually act like angels and, and, and how that's impacting how companies are getting funded. So um, maybe I'll give you the entrepreneur's viewpoint. Um, and I, I just think that uh, now more than ever, the, the whole angel investing model, especially for consumer internet, makes a lot of sense. And I didn't have this feeling in earlier companies that I did, but I, again, if I haven't repeated it enough times, I absolutely do have that feeling right now, um, that it's a very viable model and one should look at it. And I think um, VCs are, are sensing that as well, so they've either set aside funds or they're willing to do smaller investments or incubate you or do entrepreneur and residence programs because I think the whole venture economics have changed quite a bit in the last few years with the change in exits and the type of exits you can get. I think f other than some funds, they have gotten smaller and more focused. And so you would expect to see those kind of activities. And I think the professional angel is a lot more attractive than the casual angel because the casual angel is, is really about money and the professional angel is about value add mm -hmm. and with, appro with the appropriate background and the appropriate contacts. Mm -hmm. So even though I've taken money from casual angels before, I, at this point I would seriously look at professional angels if I was doing a company. Yeah, I think, again, just to kind of give you a practical answer, a majority of the angels out there, um, I've done a keynote on this, I think there are 100,000 angel investors in the U.S. That's a pretty broad definition, right? Family and friends are included in that. So those are people that have high conviction and will probably give you money at any term. And then there are people that kind of make three, four investments a year. It's kind of a cool thing to do. Uh, maybe they're like great lawyers and doctors or other professional services had some money. They kind of enjoy, you know, the thrill of getting involved in a company. I think there are two key things you're looking for here. Number one, active, right? You need to make sure that the person is active, is investing right now, not in the past right now. What is their track record? Are they actively investing? Number two, um, everything else being equal, the more investments uh, or a more comprehensive prof portfolio an angel has, more pattern recognition, hence uh, better conviction, easier conviction, right? Uh, and it also gives you more data points of how they made those decisions. You can probably see more trends in the investment decisions they made. If somebody's already made two, two investment decisions over a course of five years, well, draw your own conclusion versus somebody that kind of has a comprehensive portfolio and is very active, Again, you know, those, those are all about probabilities of 
you know, connecting with the angel. And then also, just be very clear, I mean, some angels invest in smaller amounts, some angels in bigger amounts. I think the other distinction here is, you know, some people uh, have, have huge wealth and they can invest in huge amounts. Some of the angels have professional funds so they can invest in comparable amounts. And some of the angels might invest in smaller amounts yet add value in different ways. And just be clear who's who and who do you need. And you probably might need some combination of those in your syndicate. Um, and make sure that you optimize for that, but also be very clear, don't go after 100 people that invested 5K each. Don't also just go after one person that's gonna invest a million, because that's probably gonna move a little bit more difficult, so have a balance somewhere in, in the middle. I'll speak to the, uh, the issue of, of venture funds moving downstream into the angel market, because that's something I have a bit of a bias about. Um, you know, venture funds typically have uh, large, large pools of capital and, and relatively few investing partners. And for them to be able to invest, uh, to, to pr provide the kind of return that their limited partners are expecting, they need to put a lot of money to work and they need to have uh, big successes. And that, that structure does not uh, translate well into systematic angel investing. Um, so uh, it, to me, I, it, it may seem appealing to have you know, uh, A-level brand name venture firm investing in your seed round alongside uh, you know, value-added angels and value-added uh, seed funds, but it's it's problematic. It, it it can it can be extremely helpful. It can be it can be a problem, particularly when you're trying to raise your next round, uh, because you've sort of got uh, you know the upside is you know uh, you've got. Uh, brand A, A-level, you know, institutional VC firm there, you know, standing, presumably ready to write a check. They know they're inside the tent. They know everything that's going on. Um, if for any reason they choose not to invest, uh, you might as well forget about it. It's exceptionally hard then to raise capital, to explain to another investor why, you know, Joe here, who's, who's uh, been backing you and, and following you for 18 months, has decided not to follow you. So. There are enough sources of uh, high-quality, value-added angel money today that I would be reticent to, to access institutional venture VC at the, at the seed round. Hey, so, uh, I was going to add, just because I took some institutional angel. Um, I, I sort of segment the angel investor into four categories, and this is what we did at the time we were raising. The first is sort of institutional angels. And these are, I wouldn't call the big venture firms that have angel arms. I would call these are the venture firms that basically focus on, you know, series A or very early investing, which we ended up taking half of our series A from. The second would be professional angels. The third I call operational angels. These would be CEOs, people who know how to build businesses from the early stage, or people who have operational excellence in your category. They don't necessarily have to be people that were at the senior level. And the fourth is just people with money. And when we were raising, we took really a hybrid of you know the people with money, the operational angels, the professional angels, and we had this institutional venture investor. But I feel extremely strongly that you want your lead, if possible, to be a professional angel or to be an institutional venture firm that acts like an angel. Because when we went to late, raise later rounds, they were hugely important in representing the entire uh, angel group uh, as a cohesive unit and adding a lot of value to that fundraising process. And I got huge advantage from operational angels, people that were CEOs of companies or who had built businesses in our category. You know, if I were to do it all over again today, I would not take any money from people who just had money, uh, but at the time we didn't have that luxury. Um, but I think that they're, you know, for the very early stage VCs, there can be very value add, um, but not the tra traditional firms that just put small amounts in to dabble. That was our experience. So, you know, it's interesting because we always think of um, investors do dil due diligence on the entrepreneurs and the companies. Um, what kind of due diligence should entrepreneurs be doing on you as investors, and what have you guys, you both have done in terms of the due diligence on your investors? Um, sure. Um, so initially, uh, when I first started out in my first company, I was uh, very keen to involve a uh, good venture capitalist in my company and in, in my idea, uh, idea and to take money from them. And so I thought, you know, with their help, um, you know, VC, VC back firms, you know, have a higher exit rate or success rate. That was my impression. And, um, you know, I didn't do too much due diligence on them because I was just keen to get them involved. So I didn't care if they were Dracula at night. I just, I wanted their firm's name into 
my company because I thought that would assure our success as a company. Uh, of course, you know, in subsequent rounds, uh, in subsequent co companies, this changed. So I actually either had a relationship with them already. Uh, again, I was introduced as a trusted source. I asked for other entrepreneurs that they had worked with. Um, I checked some of the blogs about what was being written about them. And, uh, and then the third company, you know, not only did I know, uh, you know, want to know them and their firms and so on and so forth, all that level of due diligence, um, but I also stayed away from firms who just had a bad buzz, okay? So I wouldn't even go to them, even though somebody said, so-and-so is really keen to meet you. But some other entrepreneurs had already told me that, oh, you know, they had a bad experience or, or the firm had an experience of doing X. And so even if they had great cachet, I just felt, you know, that since I was doing this out of choice now, that I could choose. And so why would I even waste my time with them? And so those that had a bad buzz or reputation, you know, I wouldn't even bother to check their references. I just didn't want to, 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 to I didn't want to partner with them really. So I was just going to add one other simple thing. So uh, I think this is also kind of an expansion of our discussion. There's always this question of how much money to take, which firm to take from, and another important data point. So when you're approaching a VC, let's say the fund is $100 million. So just to return the $100 million, if they made five investment decisions and all of them were sold for $100 million and they own 20% of the company. So that's pr pretty much what they're going to shoot for, right? Look at the fund size and that's pretty much the minimum exit they're looking for and still they have to get five of those just to return the fund. Needless to say, the two to three X exit that they need to return to their LPs, right? So that kind of gives you kind of a spectrum of, okay, uh, how much strings will the VC attach or how much of my company they're going to want to have? Because if it's a really large fund, then they're going to want to have 30, 40% of your company because because if the outcome is big, they need an even bigger number, so they're gonna wanna own a bigger percentage. And the way I always like to work with my uh, entrepreneurs and my founders is your job is to maximize the probabilities of a successful outcome, right? I don't know what that success is. That success could be a billion dollar IPO, which is less and less likely these days, or it could be a you know, 50 to 100 million exit to a really good company like Google, and I've seen a lot of those, even in the deepest recession. And what I always tell people is, I cannot tell you what the right decision is, but what I can tell you is your job is to maximize the likely outcomes and choose between different outcomes, right? Never be cornered to only making one decision. That's the worst thing you can do. So your job is to basically optimize for that. And to do the homework for that is really simple. And like Bob said, that's one of the disadvantages of venture firms. And the reason why they're getting so active in seed investing is because the number of companies that have the kind of traction and scale they're looking for a lot fewer, the number of exits are a lot fewer. And angel investors have kind of taken the early lead what the venture capital firms once used to be. So they're feeling that if they're not playing in our space, they cannot be competitive in the Series Bs or Series Cs, so they're trying to be more aggressive in that space. I'd like to reiterate something that Aiden said earlier. It, there are, there's a wealth of, of uh, information readily available, more so every day, about uh, every investor, the prospective investor that you can meet uh, or hope to meet. And you should be very diligent about uh, researching actively before you meet people, you know, while after you meet people, due diligence on them. Ask the prospective investor to introduce you to people that they've invested in before. Uh, good, you know, with good experiences and bad experiences, call them, ask them, ask those entrepreneurs how they, whether the, the relationship with that prospective investor was a positive one. The more diligence you do, the, the, you, you reduce dramatically the likelihood of any, any kind of uh, uh, negative uh, result. So I would just add one thing. I think that it's always, you know, when times are good, the um, feedback you're going to get is always positive, so it's important to ask for those um, situations where things didn't really turn out the way that either party had hoped and how that was handled, because I think that that's going to give you a perspective on, on how the investor is going to treat you when things go sideways and you know things are not um, marching according to plan because in a startup there's lots of landmines in front of you and there's always things are always going to be off course. It's how you course correct and whether you do it at the same time and hand in hand that makes a big difference. Yeah, I talked about the, the difference between the, uh, um, the angels, the operational and uh, professional people with money, where the negotiator, where the terms are the same, where they're always like convertible notes were the same, or was there variation in the terms were the same for our, all four groups in our deal, which was not, it was not a convertible, but <coughs> we just closed a series A. 
but the terms were same for everyone we talked to in that group. The, the second question, which uh, Aiden touched on, which is uh, what is generally, it seems like there is some kind of rule of thumbs, like uh, uh, Bob mentioned, 12 to 18 months is when you put forward to build a good service product and before you want to raise this next round. Or a ABC fund would look for, uh, what is the typical amount that ABC fund would look for into a company? Look, I mean, like I said, I think it's a moving target. You have to be very careful. I mean, we're trying to be helpful to you by giving some, you know, milestones, but don't take this as a rule. So a um, couple quick things. So number one, uh, I think between convertible and Series A, I think anything that's under a half a million could be quickly closed and has the right incentives for investors. Convertible notes are great. They don't provide enough incentives for the sophisticated investors. So the moment you're going above 750K to a million, I think a price round makes more sense, even though, you know, the voice inside of you is saying, yes, I would like to have a convertible note. Like I said, it's a balance. In general, uh, most VC firms want to have at least 20% of a company. Um, you know, I don't think for angels that number is all over the place, but like make sure that they have enough stakes so that they care about your company enough. Uh, and then um, uh, what, was the, what was the other question that we're talking about? I think you were saying what percentage of the company do they really want to own? And I think that 20%, right. I agree. 20%, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's also associated with the size of the fund? Or the uh, you know, like I said, I give, just look at the size of the fund. The other question you asked is how much money to raise for, right? And then again, I'm talking mostly for consumer internet and mobile. If you're in consumer goods, if you're in retail, if you're in life sciences, these are completely different things. You might have to raise a lot more money if you're in semiconductor. I mean, I don't know if you have a factory or you're, you know, just a chip design, whatever it is. But it used to be that six to 12 months was okay. After the 2009 and recession, I think it's still true. There is not enough liquidity out there, even though the stock market has decided, you know, started to pick up. I would still say conservatively, 18 months is what you should look for. And there is always, a, again, you know, traditional rule of thumb is whatever you think uh, you're going to do, it's probably going to take twice as long and you're going to need twice as much money. I don't know. Strike a happy balance, right? Things are never going to go as expected. Have a cushion. Don't run out of money. But don't raise too much money that is going to give you too much luxury or, you know, too much relax. You, know, you, you have to be in some kind of a stressful and uh, aggressive uh, time schedule here. So you have to make sure that everything is lined up. <coughs> It almost seems that I'm in this position where the first million is sort of this convertible note, friends and family, because quite frankly, you have PowerPoint and you're a new entrepreneur and that's the easiest way to get off the ground. And is that what the, you angels are seeing? You're going in after sort of that convertible note, friends and family, in with kind of a small Series A? Or do you actually invest in first-time entrepreneurs with a PowerPoint? Yeah, I'll respond to that one. Yes, I do uh, invest in first-time entrepreneurs with a PowerPoint. Um, a lot depends really on, on uh, you know, sort of a visceral feeling uh, exiting a first meeting about uh, the person's ability to succeed. And then, you know, it, it, as, was, as the point was made earlier that, you know, the, the time period necessary to get to a decision depends in, in large part on a number of variables, but one really important one is what's the entrepreneur's track record. First entrepreneur, you know, first-time entrepreneur typically takes a longer, you know, longer process time. But the the fact that you're a first-time entrepreneur does not uh, is not a, you know, a, a, a limiting factor for me in terms of making a decision. I think it also depends on how hot your area is, right? So I'm just going to use an example. I'm just talking to a founder right now. And I'm just going to say, as I get uh, build more and more track record, I'm probably leaning more towards uh, people that have some traction or some proof point. I mean, it could be just a demo site, right? I'm not looking for crazy things unless something that is just a PowerPoint slide. But, you know, if your area is difficult and it's going to be hard to convince people and it's not one of those hot areas, you have to do whatever it takes as an entrepreneur to get to the first milestone. That milestone could be shipping the product. It milestone could be having some revenue. Being able to say that is a very important thing. If it happens with family money, great. If it happens with friends money, great. If it happens with Series A, great. If it happens with convertible, it doesn't matter what that is. The most important thing is to get to that milestone and then improve your chances of getting the funding to get to the next milestone, whatever it's going to take to get that traction. I'm going to move to this side. Uh, my question is that um, there's so many VCs and angels out there. Um, so is there any resources you would recommend for a startup to find out each individual's background and tracking record 
you know, VC or angel, angel uh, groups. And the second question I have is that um, there's so many questions we hear is that start looking for funding. So I want to hear your point of view, you know, you know, angel or a VC point of view, to see what's your problem, what's your challenges you are facing. Um, so, in order to see who are the VCs and what their track record is, there's a uh, website I think called Venture Source. Uh, there's, there's a few of them, but that's one that you can uh, look at and that lists all the VCs and their investments. Um, I think the funded may have something as well, um, some information on companies. and. Uh, well, this issue of Business Week that just came out is all about angels. In fact, Ron Conway is on the cover, and Aiden's on that list, okay, as one of the top 20. He's doing okay. out. I think he's number 13 in terms of his, so everything about angels. Finally, I made it to a list, so I can say I'm in a list now. So you can check that, you know, and this, you know, Google it. And it's, uh, uh, anyway, it's in the, this issue of Business Week this week. It's all about angels, so I was very excited to see that. Um, so, in, in terms of what problems you face, I mean, I'll let I'll turn that over to you guys. Yeah, and I was going to ask, there is, I mean, there are all these lists, I mean, trust me, but it's the same thing, just because I went to business school, I wasn't a different person, and just because I'm on a list, I'm not like some special angel or anything like that, so hopefully I can still keep helping entrepreneurs. Um, there is also Forbes Midas list. Again, there are all these lists that it gives you some information, right? Just because you're in a Midas list, does that make you a great VC? I don't know, but it's some yardstick, and you just look at the investment decisions they made. Like I said, I think more important than the investor's name or a firm's name is the partner who you're going to work with and the, you know, your chances of creating the positive bias towards your idea. My biggest challenge as an investor is... Um, I'm an entrepreneur like yourself. I don't have anybody helping me. I don't have any admin. I'm always missing out on things. I can't follow up on every lead. And for instance, I don't have a very good rating on funded. It's because I can't respond to every entrepreneur. A lot of times, I can't even explain why I can't get to someone because I don't have time. And that's probably my biggest challenge because the only way I can be successful is optimizing which bets I make because I have to make those bets count. And like I said, I'm getting 10 to 15 leads. There's no way I'm going to be able to get all of them every day. And that's, that's my biggest challenge. But my hope is that by supporting the right entrepreneurs and creating success there, like one of the coolest things about being on that list, they actually listed how many jobs were created by the companies I backed and how much money was raised. So I'm like, wow, like not only was I lucky at Google, but I was able to back companies that created new businesses and created new jobs. So there is some satisfaction of seeing that. But anyway, Bob. Yeah, like the, my biggest challenge is just not having enough time uh, in the day to, to meet, to meet with everybody who wants to meet with me. Uh, I like, like I, I don't have a, uh, uh, an admin or much infrastructure, and I'm, uh, I, my record is, is spotty at best at making meetings and, and returning calls just because the list of things that I have to do is you know, a mile long every day, like an entrepreneur. So it's about optimizing and, and uh, you know, trying to uh, direct my efforts to where they'll produce the, the, uh, the best result. And, and a lot of times that you know, means I, I don't do everything that everybody expects me to do. I sent a resource, I'm going to that, it's just angelsoft.net. So I'm with the Sierra Angels, we're um, uh, based in uh, Lake Tahoe, and they're mostly made up of retired um, entrepreneurs from the Silicon Valley that are retired from Lake Tahoe. Uh, so we hang out and we use Angelsoft as a syndication software, and um, it's useful because it's a good way to get a quick view of the deals. So you can also get creative. So one of the best advice that I heard when I was starting angel investing as a VC friend of mine told me that if you want to make sure that the product that you're investing is not bad, try doing a Google search with the product or company name and then sucks. Because I mean, you'd, you'd be blown away. Just try this for anything. You'd be blown away how much information you can get by just doing the simple thing. Then create some iteration, right? I mean, Google my name and just say, oh, he's an awful guy, whatever. I mean, I have no idea what people are saying about me. And then you can meet me and kind of balance the two, right? Like, maybe I'm like that, maybe I'm not, I don't know. Uh, but again, it doesn't really take rocket science to find out information about someone through LinkedIn, through their track record, through these lists and everything else. So. Yeah, the only thing I was going to add is if you're an entrepreneur and you go to your board meeting and you say that, you know, you're not getting back to everyone because you don't have an assistant. The first thing your investors say, will we go get an assistant? So maybe, maybe you guys should. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I sense an intern opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Over here. When's a good time to form an advisory board? And when you're in an early stage, will that be 
don't have enough traction, how do you go about getting the interest of a potential value add advisor? Uh, one quick thing I want to highlight here. Be very careful when you're doing the advisory board. The thing that you have to watch out is, I love your company. I don't want to uh, risk the chance of investing my own money, but I can be advisor for a percentage of the company uh, or angel groups that charge you to present. I mean, those kind of things I think is like a ruckus. But uh, on the other hand, an advisory board is really important in the sense that especially if you're a chip company or life sciences uh, and your risks are a lot higher and you have to overcome really high odds, uh, an advisory board can be extremely helpful in convincing your investors that when you do hit those rough milestones and you need to execute on it, your advisors can help you open some of those doors. They could be people that can help you generate sales. They could be people that can call FDA. I don't know who they are, but be very, very clear that they have a clear value add and not just names to add on the advisory list. Because there will be people that are like, oh, I can't really invest, but I would love to be your advisor for 5% of your company. So, you know, you have to make that decision. You know, I've, uh, the, the big challenge from an entrepreneur's perspective of an advisory board is actually making use of that advisory board. So I've many times had lots of people ready to be advisors and given them, you know, some token <coughs> amount of shares uh, to keep their interest and then never had time to really have an advisory board meeting or have one that's at all useful. Uh, or have, and then they get busy, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, two years are over, they earned their shares, and you never talked to them, and they never did anything for you. And the problem is with putting people on advisory boards is it's really difficult to get them off. Uh, because and then, <laughs> then, then it's like insulting, like you never called me, you never had time for me, you didn't ask me for my advice, and now you want to throw me out. Like You can actually ruin a great relationship if you don't handle it correctly. So over the years, I've experimented with the advisory board structure, and I think the best advi advisory boards are, for me, what worked was really small, like two or three people. So you have time to talk to them. And then I made it so it wasn't tied to a meeting, it was tied to sort of quarterly action items or quarterly meetings with me. So you would get shares, but they vest, you know, they vest when you meet with me. So we have to have a meeting. And it was surprising how many advisory board members called me and said, hey, uh, we haven't met this month. What do you need? So it was like, a, you know, 5,000 shares, but we have to have this meeting. So you really have to spend time in organizing that program and then making use of it. And when advisory boards don't work, it's because of us, the entrepreneurs. Because you know you can see the person, you can see that they're interested, you can figure out what's right to give them. So why isn't it working? Why is it a waste of your shares? Because you didn't have time to tap into them properly. So I would keep that in mind. So two more things real quick. Uh, don't have two founders and 10 advisors, right? Mm. I mean, you also want to build a team. If people don't want to work with you but still want to kind of have the option of benefiting from the company's success, that's another important thing. And, um, um, uh, the lo and, and again, your advisors are not a substitute for your ability to execute. So don't just think that having 10 incredible advisor names is going to get you over the hurdle of like convincing the investors that um, um, you can deliver. But Anu actually is absolutely right that a small number, again, be very clear what specific value they're adding and make sure that the incentives are aligned. So like tie it to actual meetings or sometimes actual deliverables. Who cares about two years? It could be two hours. You make the call, you get me this deal, you get shares. It's as simple as that, so. Yeah, the only thing I was gonna add to that is, is what I've noticed, because we've had advisors at different stages of the company that one of the mistakes we made when we started the company was we had a small number of shares. And so for an advisor, you know, they might get a thousand shares, which seemed like nothing. But later in the company's history, we did a split, people had more shares. And many times it's just, it seems like they have a larger number, even though the value is no different. Um, and so when I look back, had we had more shares, I probably could have given up less of the company, um, which would have been more appropriate uh, given the amount of value we gave. So I just always tell people, it's better to have more shares in the beginning. This, most people don't ask. So. And there's some advisors that, that are good. Like, for example, if you're going to go into a sales cycle to an enterprise, or you're going to go into a sales cycle to a drug company, or something like that, and you have, you know, the X, you know, some reg, big regulatory muckety muck, or call, Colin Powell, or somebody, then, you know, it's great to have them on the website. Don't expect to ever talk to them, but you know, it'll make your sales act a little bit easier, and maybe there'll be a couple of calls. So there's some cachet to having those names that help you with your specific vertical as well. So we had a question over here. So you mentioned earlier that as an investor, it's not a good idea to call 
every day you have to remember to receive a but what's the reason of time should time as you should call not on other I would love Bob to chime in here too, but I think the ideal scenario, and some uh, uh, CEOs and founders do this really well, like Todd, they give you quarterly updates. I think that's kind of the minimum amount of time you need to be able to show traction, even though some of my companies can iterate as fast as every two weeks. Uh, I think it has to be reasonable of time and just some update. I mean, I don't need to every know everything that's happening in the business. I want to know you're not running out of money. Uh, hopefully, you're fighting for leadership. Hopefully, you're executing, and you know the company is growing, both in terms of revenues, traction, or some other metric. And you're hiring the right people, right? It's not that that complicated. I think the important thing here is not to mix. Like, if I have to call the entrepreneur to get information out, then I made the wrong decision, right? I think it's only the respectful thing to do, and it doesn't have to be formatted. Just send me a half-page email saying, "Here's the updates, and by the way, here are two things I need help with." Can you, you know, can any of you guys? And it doesn't. It could be just go to all the investors. So it's great. Like now I know the company is doing okay, and I know two specific things that I can be of help. Uh, why would I need to have to call you every week to find out how you're doing? Number one and two to justify my existence as an investor or board member. You normally see that when people only make two investments a year and they have to justify, I only have two investments per year because I have to spend a lot of time with them. I'm like, it doesn't matter. You know, are you making any difference for them or not? From an entrepreneur's perspective, I think. Um, you want your your um, investors to be investors, not managing your company, and so, you know, um, you know, I have I've, I've dealt with both types. I've had investors who talk to you every day, which is very very annoying, um, and uh, the others that are not available enough, and you really need them and you need their help. So. It's really important to set up, you know, the right level of communication. So basically, I don't like my investors to be surprised, and I know that in order to make full use of them, I have to, I have to ask. And so, if I don't keep them up to date, how they, they're traveling around, they might see a business deal. They won't even recognize that it's a good deal for me because I forgot to tell them that I'm having these three incredible sales cycles and incredible results with some implementation that I just did, right? So you have to strike the, the right balance there. One of the things that I do, a, pr a practical point, is is uh, early on after making an investment, I agree with the entrepreneur what the, the KPIs are for the business. And uh, I encourage the entrepreneur to, you know, every week, every couple of weeks, publish something. It can be as simple as a Google Doc or Google Spreadsheet that outlines result, you know, performance over the past, whatever the, the relevant time horizon is. It's an easy way for the entrepreneur to do it on his own, his or her own time, for me to view it on my own time without uh, interfering with the entrepreneur, and for issues to be to be identified and addressed, you know, relatively promptly. And I'm just going to add one other thing on Bob. The reason why I like consumer internet and mobile, this point is very important. How do you define success of a business? On the internet is very simple. Do you have users? Are they growing? Are you making money of them? And you can measure it very quickly. That's one of the, thing, the reasons I like it, because I can actually see if it's working. And if it's not working, we can fix it. In a traditional business, say, like I was in textiles, I have to order the textiles. It has to be manufactured. It has to come. It has to go to the store. By the time I know that I failed, it's been six months, and it's too late to change the train. So again, for every business, there are different metrics and there are different criteria, but, you know, just wanted to add that. So, and we have a question over here. Under what situations should an entrepreneur pay to present to an Egypt group? Never. Yeah, never. <laughs> That's a great discussion. Never. It's never. Actually, that was one of my questions, too. I was just invited to pitch uh, or launch our company, a demo, 2010, coming up. Um, and I was interested with in Anu and Todd, if you ever did any of these, not necessarily pay to pitch, I actually declined because the $20,000 would have got me my iPhone app, so I decided not to do that. Um, but when you're naive as an entrepreneur, you can get sucked into that very easily because you're, you know, you're invited, it sounds like it's a great opportunity, which it, it would have been a great opportunity. Um, but I'm not going to pay the ticket, but did Anu and Todd go that route doing like a bigger pitching, like maybe TechCrunch 50 or something like that. Yeah, and I, I'd like to ask Bob and I am if, he, if they actually go to any of these, these events. So I'm trying to look at the effect of time of, you know, for entrepreneurs too who are really busy running around doing everything, wearing a cap. Is this something in a, as an effective approach to go ahead and do to take this route? Or would it be better to sit face to face and try and get those meetings with the potential investors? Um, I can chime in, you know, um, on the, have I ever done it? So, 
as an entrepreneur, you'll be approached by a lot of these trade events, um, you know, to pay to pitch. Um, so it's like a participation fee, it's like a trade show, right? Uh, or, you know, we'll, uh, it's a $16,000 production fee and you can be on all the, you know, programs on American Airlines, okay? I've never done those. I've actually never pitched at any of those events. Um, and, uh, you know, the minute I say well, there's a production fee, I'm like, okay, well, great. This is, when you think I'm newsworthy, I'll do it. Um, so, but I've actually been a judge and attended a demo. And um, I find great startups over there, right? So, you know, I mean, it's, it's really up to, you know, if you, if you have a targeted group of people that you want to meet, I, I don't think that these trade shows in particular aren't bad venues. Because you do have a certain number of uh, angels and VCs walking around, and you, you, I love to attend them because I see good, you know, great things, and uh, it's a, it's a great uh, way to find out what's new, and you definitely meet a lot of VCs and and uh, angels that are walking around trying to see what's new. So it just depends on if you want this huge exposure or you have a targeted list that you're going after anyway, and what the cash flow situation is. Yeah, I was just going to add, my father's actually a member of the Koretsu Forum, which is one of the angel groups that, that charges, and I personally didn't go and pay the fee and pitch to it, and I think that there's a lot of uh, other options than paying to pitch to raise money, and I think that if, if it can be avoided, I, th I would definitely recommend it. Uh, in terms of the m big marketing conferences, I think there's there's a lot of success that's come out of TechCrunch 50, and, and similarly with Demo. Um, you know, for us, I, I've just seen so many companies pour a lot of capital into these events, you know, conferences and things like that. I think like a marketing launch, like a one-time thing makes some sense. And for us, there's a specific set of conferences, which are, you know, there's 150 people that we st sit in a room and give a half an hour presentation to who are the exact buyers that buy our products. So for that, for us, that makes sense, but almost nothing else has. So I just, you know, I just ruthlessly manage that, that 20 grand and, you gotta be pretty damn sure it's money well spent to spend it, I think. I think Todd and Anu are absolutely right. It has to be for a very specific reason. These days, the only events I go to and I might pay a high price for is to basically have 100 meetings all at once, right? So Todd said 50 investors. You can go to one of these events and feel like you can meet 40 of them, then it's a good investment, but don't go to these events. I don't think any of us would make an investment because a company was selected into one of these events and like one of the top 10 finalists, whatever. I mean, it's nice to have, but I don't think that solely justifies the decision. The biggest important for you uh, thing for you is networking. I mean, networking for sales, networking to raise money. If any one of these events would facilitate it and has very high quality people, I have to underscore three times high quality people, not just you know uh, people that you're going to run into. Uh, that's then that, that definitely you have to make that call, but then it's worth paying for. I think we have time for two questions. So, um, as angels, how do you feel about the different ways? Uh, uh, companies uh, getting equity into the hands of key employees before the angel rent, right? So, you know, options, warrants, stock grants, and so, so you know, kind of what are your preferences? And also, um, how do you think about the pricing of those different options um, if they're, you know, close in time to the angel, uh, to the angel rent? I'll take that one. I, th I think in, in most cases, uh, empirically, um, founders and, and em employees on board prior to my investment are uh, compensated by uh, you know, restricted stock purchases. So uh, they actually purchase the stock with a buyback. Uh, a buyback, a company buyback right, and it's subject to vesting and so on. Yeah, you know, one of the things that that uh, angels, uh, you know, more sophisticated angels or or funds do is, you know, impose the same sort of controls on a company that a VC might. So try to work out the issues of founder vesting and and so forth in a way that will make the company uh, unobjectionable for a for a downstream investor. Uh, you know, pricing typically is is uh, you know a, a cent. You know, uh, you know as close to zero as possible um, at, at the very early stage, and that and there's not a whole lot of objection around that. I, I don't think. 
I, I completely agree with Bob. A uh, couple things. I, I, so mostly after the investment is a 409A process, and you have to do it with professional evaluators. It's important to have balance uh, in terms of you know one funder having 80 percent, and then everybody else having 0.01. I mean, you kind of want balance. You want key employees to be uh, incented, and you want there to be sufficiently large option pool for new key employees. Again, it depends if you have two people, ten people. Who do you need to hire to kind of round out the team, and that it's balanced, and then the people have the right incentives. But an important part of the one, one point, important part of the, the uh, pricing discussion in, in any priced round is the size of the pool. You know, there are three elements to to uh, venture valuation. It's you know the valuation, uh, the size of the pool, and the founder stay. Um, and that's you know there are rules of thumb about how large a pool should be, but ultimately that's that's a, that's a negotiated item. Um, I know you said you guys or all of you have a long list of things you have to do. How? What's the best way to get in contact with you know with, a, with an angel or like to pitch to pitch a bit uh, to pitch a uh, bit like company? Like, what, how do you get you know away from your busy days like to pitch a, a proposal to a possible angel? I, I have filters, you know, I, uh, natural filters that we've talked about before. Um, entrepreneurs that I've worked with, uh, lawyers, uh, is a, because of my background, uh, is, is a good filter for me. Virtually every startup company, you know, goes to, a, many go to a lawyer before they, they uh, look for capital. So I, I see a lot of deals referred in from lawyers. Um, other investors in my network with whom I've invested previously. Uh, uh, Series A are institutional venture firms who see deals that, uh, they think aren't exactly ripe for an investment by them will send stuff down. So, but, but you know, for me, the, the, the you know, if, if it doesn't, if, if, if there's not a referral from a trusted source, the likelihood that I'll see it is, is diminished greatly. Uh, for me, it's, it's you know, it, it depends on uh, the uh, sector that the company's in and the amount being raised, but, but generally it's 100 to 250,000 initial investment and then reserve some to continue to participate. And it's uh, 25 to 150 for me with, you know, most of the investment being somewhere in the middle. And coming back to the earlier question, uh, how do you meet an investor? You know what? Be as creative as you can. Uh, if somebody is a big biker, instead of schedule a meeting, say, hey, can we go for a bike ride? You know, I mean, just be different, right? So if everybody is asking for a coffee meeting, you should be asking for the bike ride. If the person is a big golfer, hey, you know, I happen to be a good golfer too. Can we, like, talk? You know, just make the discussion as pleasurable as possible and don't make it like, hey, I'm going to the dentist. Oh, my God. Like, this person is desperate to get the funds. They haven't done their homework, da, da, da. You know, like, just go through the checklist and, you know, make the meeting, you know, increase your likelihood of getting that meeting, find the right connections, you know, think out of the box. Yeah, I invited Aiden to coffee and it still worked, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, he invited me to coffee in my previous uh, shop in San Francisco where I buy all my magazines, so that definitely works. So, so we're actually out of time. I'm going to allow one more qu quick question, hopefully. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know if you are currently working with a particular company that, let's just say, is, say it's a, uh, a software, let's just say, and another software company comes and it's similar, but not exactly the same, but definitely competitive. Would you even entertain speaking to them, or would it be something that you would just, you know, not look at just because you already have an investment with a company that's similar? Um, so I think, look, these days it's happening more and more. I mean, I've just been amazed at how many times, like, I'll see a company and within three weeks there are, like, seven other companies that are in the same space. To the extent that I can, I try not to invest in any one of them because I feel that if there are six, seven, one of them, they're going to all kill each other's business, outprice them and, you know, hire each other's talent. In some cases, I can't help it. I mean, there is a situation where, you know, I invested in three companies. One of them was Todd's company, and they started in all different places, and within a year and a half ended up in the right place. I can't control that. And I'm also very upfront and tell the entrepreneurs, I can't sign an NDA. Only tell me whatever you need to tell me that's necessary for me to get a reasonable idea. I mean, exercise good judgment. Obviously, if I do something that's really bad, I'm not going to be in business, so I'm never going to do that. But also, I can't really help like hearing things, right? I mean, you'll, you'll see things that, that happen. It almost happens too quickly. Sometimes you hear 
100 without even people intending to pitch you. So um, unfortunately, it's the nature of our business and things are moving really small. Like I said, exercise good judgment. And, and I try to be very upfront and transparent and I say, look, I have these companies in my portfolio or I've seen this and this. So I try to be upfront in terms of explaining my circumstances to people so they can make the best decision for themselves. For guys like us who are, are you know, have our prof you know, semi-professional, whatever, have, have websites and so forth, it's a lot easier for you to do diligence and figure out whether, at, at least reduce the probability that there's going to be a conflict of interest. My policy is if somebody sends me, you know, an executive summary that's clearly in conflict with a company that, uh, that I've already invested in, I'll tell them. I'll say, you know, take a look at this company, you know, if you think that that's, uh, you know, my investment involvement in that company is a problem for you, you know then don't call me back. If you, if you still want to meet, uh, I'd be interested to meet. But you have to be aware that, you know, even the most scrupulous, honorable people, you know, are going to, you know, information is going to get shared in, in, in some way. And uh, that may or may not be, be productive for you. You know, um, there are VCs and angels um, that uh, have this information on their website and others don't. Um, and I've actually had experiences where a VC is looking at two emerging deals, including one of us, mine, and they've been incubating the competitor in, in their own office space, and they didn't tell us about it. And they actually asked us, like, meeting after meeting, like, oh, well, okay, let's say three meetings. What are you finding out? Is this a valid space? Who did you, which customer did you talk to? And then there's a meeting when they said, could you lay out your product vision for the next two years on the board? And I actually got up to write it and then something was that creepy. So I said, you know, let's not go there. You know, I, you know, I've got term sheets coming up and I ended the meeting. So you'll meet all kinds of people. And uh, what, what is, it's up to you, what I've learned is that you just have to be very careful how much of your kimono you're willing to open, okay? <laughs> yeah. So on that you just have to just say enough, but not yeah. everything, ever. So on that note, I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>